Good morning, Shepherd Toss. It's great to see you today. Let's stand to our feet and let's sing and declare that our God is great. Amen.
seated in power, majesty on high. Enthroned above it all, we sing the Concerning Jesus on the night before his crucifixion and death, Jesus knew what was about to happen to him. And as we approach Good Friday, I want us all to go to that moment together and meditate on it together. Jesus and his disciples came to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he would be betrayed. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul, is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus, the King of heaven, his heart was broken knowing that he was about to face the wrath of God for sin, not his own. That is the cup he was to drink from. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. Through sorrow and agony, he obeyed him perfectly. He laid his life down to redeem sinners, to pay our debt, and to cry out on that cross, it is finished. I just want to encourage us to think about Jesus that night in the garden as we continue to worship our matchless Savior together.
Thank you for singing with us. You can take your seats. Thank you. Well, good morning, Shepherd's House family. It's a joy to get to worship the Lord Jesus with you and grateful for that last song and the the preparation for Good Friday and for Easter that uh, has begun. Today is Palm Sunday. If you didn't know, uh, it is the day that Christ entered into Jerusalem and the people cried, Hosanna, and those same people, many of them would cry, crucify him this Friday. And we'll I get the chance to reflect on that as well all weekend long upcoming. If you're new here, my name is Kosti. I just want to say a warm welcome to you. Welcome to Shepherd's House. We love you. We're grateful that you would come and worship with us today. I get the privilege of serving as the teaching pastor here alongside a a really faithful team and staff who would love to serve you. And so if you've never done this before, go to our resource center right after the service. Take one of those free gift bags. There's a free book and some resources inside of there for you. And if you want to give us your information so we can keep you updated on what's going on at the church or serve you in any way, please do that. We would love to encourage you. Uh, If you're a regular here and you want to sign up for the women's conference that's coming up in April or the building campaign night on April 27th and register for that or anything else, you can give, you can get on a team, get in a group. If you need prayer, anything, go to the Resource Center. We've got you covered. A couple of quick things and then we'll jump in. First, Pastor Brett is not here and I miss him very much, even this morning. Prayer circle started uh, about five minutes late. Uh, there were multiple things that didn't go like they usually do because my handler's not here, my best friend, my, my wingman, my right arm. Uh, Pastor Brett is such a faithful part of our church, and as part of his role, he's spearheading missions efforts all over the world over the next few years. Uh, One or two a year, he'll go to different places to help establish partnerships for us and explore opportunities, because as you know, we are a church plant. Well, not really anymore. We're still in a gym. And even though we have a building campaign coming up and we've got a lot going on locally, how many of you know that there's the big C, Global Church? Amen? There's a lot that God's doing. So he, alongside Rod Shackelford, are in Uganda. They left on Thursday at about 10 p.m., They have sent me a bunch of videos and pictures. It's been so fun to see. Church has already happened there. Now we're doing church here. Uh, Great missionary partner there, Shannon Hurley and the team. So Brett's exploring that. And just keep them in prayer. I'll add them into my prayer as well. But we are really, really excited about that. And then is I know there's two services, so some are here, some are not. How many of you are going to Fiji in a few weeks? How many of you guys? Yeah, a bunch of you in here, and then there'll be more. Uh, Fun fact, we just found out today, uh, Brett texted me and said, Shannon's brother-in-law works with pre-men Choi in Fiji. We didn't even know that. And so we'll be hanging out with them. Uh, If you know, you know, and if you don't, well, we'll get you on a trip one of these days. A couple other things. Student ministry is doing camp. So they asked me to give this really exciting plug for them. Uh, There it is. I did it. There you go. Go to camp. There's no photos, but next year you'll have photos. There's, they've never been. So what we're doing, we're partnering with, uh, if you remember Austin Duncan, who was here preaching a few weeks ago for Gary's installation service, Regen, Camp Regen in New Mexico, a bunch of churches get together. I think there's like 1,500 students or something, uh, so maybe they'll meet their future spouse or just come home and keep it simple. That'd be great because they're still in high school. But uh, this is where those friendships begin or here. 
and you can do the QR code thing. Drew has all the information, our student ministry coordinator, Drew Bauer. They're going to be going. It's going to be great. There's great preaching. Some of my friends lead that ministry over there, and they are crazy about the gospel and about the word, and they have an absolute riot. And so we're, we're going to get involved with that. Last reminder, Easter is this weekend. Push cards are available at the Resource Center. I know so many of you have used these to invite friends, family, neighbors. All the information is on there. Friday is He Was Wounded, and Sunday will be He Is Risen. I'll preach thematically for both, and as I promised you last week, I'll just remind you, I promise to deliver the gospel, to do it with love and care and exhortation to your friends, your neighbors, your family. Uh, You will not be disappointed, not because I'm great, but because the gospel is great. Amen? I'll do my job, though. I promise you that. Uh, There is a number of things on this ministry event handout that you can see if you're looking for other ways to connect. And the summer relocation FAQ is still on there. If you weren't here last week and you start hearing that we're moving for 12 weeks, don't feel left out. You were gone. It was spring break. I know. It's Arizona. It's like an exodus for three weeks. And it's not even summer yet. But for 12 weeks, we're going to be shifting to the evening for a number of reasons. The FAQ is there. I tried to be a a snarky curmudgeon, one of those sweet but uh, feisty church members who asks all those questions. I put them there. I know so many of you don't ask questions like that. But we put them in there anyway. It's all there. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. We've come to this point where... Christ is going to call his first disciples. We've been going verse by verse through the gospel of Matthew. And the Lord has taught us so much. There's been much to apply already. And in this text, we see him call his first disciples. Now, the gospels all have varying accounts of this because the authors wrote with their own unique purpose, with their own unique audience. Matthew takes an interesting vantage point. I'll unpack a little bit of that for you. But what is remarkable is that Jesus calls his disciples differently, or he he ends up with disciples differently than rabbis would at that time. What do I mean by that? Well, in those days, kind of like today, how you choose your university, maybe you choose your church, disciples would assess the, the roster, if you will, or the lineup of rabbis, and they would decide which rabbi they would want to study under. They would look at his teaching his reputation, all of it, and then say, I want to go and I want to get under his teaching. I want to put my feet where he's putting his feet. And after uh, a time of being discipled, being the learner, the methetes in Greek, the one, the pupil, you would be deployed and then you would be a rabbi or you would be a teacher. So how important to get under, if you will, or behind the right kind of teacher. The student would choose and then submit and obey. But Jesus doesn't do it that way. He sees these men and he chooses them. There's a lot of purpose in this text and there's some application and we'll get to it. If you will stand one final time, let's read God's word together. Matthew chapter 4, let's read verses 18 to 22. We'll pray and then we'll jump in. Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, And Andrew, his brother, they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James and John of Zebedee, or sorry, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father. They were mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father. And followed him. That is God's word to us today. You may be seated, and let's go to him once more in prayer. Father, we ask and pray that your word would do a great work in our hearts today, whether we need conviction because of our own sin and our wayward life as a professing disciple. Maybe we're not even a disciple at all. For those of us who are going through challenges and trials, I pray the word of God would remind us that being your disciple is not easy, and yet it is hopeful and joyful. It's thrilling. We lift up Pastor Brett and Rod to you and the work going on in Uganda through our our dear brother Shannon, and we ask for your wisdom and your guidance in whatever way that we can get involved. We would like to, uh, in line with what 
our goals are, according to your word, we want to see the gospel go forth. We want to see uh, languages reached who have never heard the gospel before. We want to see pastors trained who go out to the ends of the earth to be faithful. We're willing to put our time, our energy, our money, and our sweat behind that. We just need you to make the way clear, to open doors We're willing, no matter how hard it is or how long it takes, we want to be about your mission. And so give those men a great insight, great wisdom. We pray for the team preparing for Fiji as well and for our work here locally for Easter, for the hearts who need you, for the sheep you're going to call home still, for the labor before us, all of it under your glory. With this text, shape us. And encourage us forward to be zealous disciples, followers, faithful, obedient, loving, hopeful, and eager to be under you, our leader, our teacher, our master, and our king. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. There is, in a lot of ways, an epidemic in the American church. You could say the church at large, but we're in America, so I'm going to talk about America. That you can be a disciple of Jesus, but not really follow him much. Or you could be a disciple of Jesus because you prayed a prayer once, or you said, hey, I believe in God. There's an epidemic of, I would say, anemic discipleship or underdeveloped discipleship. Maybe to go further into this visual, a shallow end discipleship. It's as though, as Christians, many times over, and the church is at fault. I'm not just blaming random people. The church at large kind of allows people to just dip their toes in the water and then hang out in the shallow end. I don't know if you have a pool. Uh, I don't, although I should say I will very soon because every year we go get one of those uh, Walmart pools. And they break each year, so you build in the budget, your little Walmart special. The kids go nuts and they don't know any better yet until they start going to birthday parties and see their friends' pools. And they're like, yeah, we don't really have a pool. I'm like, come on. But there's a beach entrance in some pools. You know what I'm talking about? The beach entrance. Maybe some of you have that. And you get the little umbrella. And there's this area that the kids can hang out and it's nice and safe. It's very easy. There's no struggle. They don't really need to learn to swim. They just kind of have to sit there. If they just stay in the shallow end, they feel like they're swimming. They feel like they're apart. They're even getting a little wet. But it's not really Swimming, it's the shallow end. A lot of churches treat discipleship this way. And following Jesus is, you know, getting a little water on you, just a little sprinkle here and there. You're out, you're you're with people, you feel like you're swimming, you're a part of the whole experience. And then one day, you venture over to uh, maybe a beach somewhere in the ocean and you're going and you say, this feels really familiar. And then you hit the deep end or you hit waves and you go, what's going on? You get tossed around, you can't swim. People go through that all the time spiritually. Maybe they hear the the full gospel from you. Maybe they hear real preaching. Maybe they hear about the way you do things in your small group, and and they say, what? You guys do what? And they're used to sitting around saying, well, here's what this verse means to me, and here's what this verse means to me. And church is sort of this thing you go to, And living for Jesus is this verbal profession, which that's important, but in general, so many people, too many people, it's sad, stay in the beach entrance, the little kiddie pool, and then when life hits, they realize, I really don't know how to swim. Discipleship is designed, biblically, to make you strong in the Lord. And the way that Jesus called his initial disciples was kind of a roadmap or a blueprint for the way discipleship should look. There was nothing uh, kiddie pool about this. There was no beach entrance to this. Jesus went after his men and then called those men to go after more men as fishers of men. And then eventually, if you think we get away with not having to live this way, you, we, you, you forgot that Matthew 28 is coming. The Great Commission is a call for the disciples to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That's why our mission statement as the church is make disciples who make disciples. Because far too often we stop short of genuine discipleship. I want to walk you through three aspects of 
Jesus' call to these men, and then we'll land the plane with three applications that we can put into practice as we live the truth. Number one is, it was a radical selection. This was a radical selection. Verse 18, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, and he said to them, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And then look at verse 21. Just jump over real quick. Going on from there, let's look at him call the other two. Two other brothers, James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee. And they were mending their nets. They were in the boat. And he says, come. He calls them. I want you to notice a few things first here again, as I mentioned in the introduction, how Jesus picked them. In those days, the rabbis, again, they got selected. This time, Jesus says, you're mine. I'm calling you. Follow me. And this is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's not unlike Romans 5.8, that while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for us and called us. He's the great initiator. He's the one who comes. He calls, he chooses, he saves, he justifies, and he redeems. Not because we said, you know, I kind of like what you offer. I think I'm going to get something good out of this. You know, let me, let me apply to a few and see which God responds to me first. Like it's picking a university. No, Jesus called them picked them, commanded them, and now he will shape them. And doesn't he do that for us? While you were lost, while you were blind, while you were dead, while you were in sin, you didn't say, you know, I think I'll change my life today. I think I'll just be better. You know what? I'm going to be the best. I'm going to fix everything starting right now. No. Oh, sure, you might have said that in response to something already happening, but Jesus was the great initiator. He was the great physician who went in there and did heart surgery on your dead heart and mine, brought it to life, and made you even want him in the first place. Why? Because he first loved us. He first called us. Second, can we just talk for a second about who Jesus picked? It's a radical selection not only because how he picked them, but who he picked. They were fishermen. These guys are uneducated, and they're most assuredly unpolished. And if you know anything about church, or if you think about church, polish is kind of what we think about. Right? People need to be put together, and the people that God picks, we often think, you know, they, they need to be sharp. Now, he's met them before in John 1.35. We actually see that. And uh, similar to what you saw when uh, the gentleman put up the verses about Jesus' process there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they harmonized Matthew, Mark, and Luke during that song, and the different verses kind of completed the story. In, in the same sense, if you harmonize the calling of the disciples, you'll see that Jesus has met these guys at other moments in other places. They're familiar with him. And they've continued to fish. What's Matthew's goal? Matthew's goal is to show you the authoritative, definitive moment when, while knowing him and having met him, he says, now come. Follow me. Be my disciple. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And they obey. And reflect with me here for a moment at large when it comes to the disciples. They're a great group, aren't they? Peter, who we pick on him a lot in church, rightfully so, he, he had it coming. He's, he's kind of a big mouth hothead, eh? He's always getting told off by Jesus. James and John, I think they're competitively driven and I think they got it from their mother. Mom eventually says to Jesus, Jesus, how about my boys on the right hand and the left hand? Can you uh, give them special seats with you? And then they're, they're a really competitive group at large because remember the whole point. They were arguing over who was the greatest and he had to tell them, no, 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 no. John the Baptist was the greatest. The servant was the greatest. Guys, you're not getting it yet. Matthew's a tax collector, one of the most hated types in those days. Even now, as April 15th approaches, we get annoyed. 
Philip is a rationalist who doesn't really have a lot of faith. He's sort of the bean counter of the group, and he's very logical and very left-brained, and I like him. We need left-brainers. I've got amazing left-brainers in my life. They are a gift from the Lord. But when Jesus is about to feed the 5,000, do you remember that story? Well, there's this unique moment, and we'll get to all this as we walk through Matthew's gospel, but I want to give you just a sneak peek about the personalities of these disciples. He asks Philip, hey, basically, how much would it cost to feed all these people? And Philip doesn't get it. The Bible actually records Jesus was testing him with the question. And he basically gives him his little spreadsheet. Well, it'll cost this much. There's this many people. Carry the two. You know, no, we don't have enough. And then he feeds them all with a miracle. Philip never got it. Now, Philip eventually leads the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ. Remember in Acts chapter 8? And then the Bible says, Luke records, he was no longer there than he was here. So Philip got it eventually. The left brain rationalist was getting teleported places miraculously. He got his. Thomas will believe it when he sees it. And on and on and on they go. What is the deal? He didn't pick the superstars. He didn't pick the number one draft picks. What did he pick? He picked men who were busy, hardworking, and responsive. I think there's a lesson there. God ain't looking for perfect this morning. He's looking for people who will live with purpose, that's for sure. If you'll get up and say, Lord, it ain't going to be pretty, but I'll get after it for you today. It ain't going to be perfect, but I'll get after it. I'll put my hands to the plow. I'll get some calluses for you. I'll keep my feet behind yours. I'll follow you. You're going to have to kind of check on me. You you might even have to pull me, but I'll be behind you. I'll stumble around, but I'll stay right behind you. You know, I, I like what Phillips commentates here. God always calls busy people. Why? The Lord's work is no place for lazy individuals. These men certainly weren't. A slothful minister of the gospel is a disgrace to the high calling of God. I like that. No, they don't have it all together, but yeah, they're willing to work hard. Where does he find them? He finds them fishing. The first two are casting nets and mending. The other two are getting ready to fish. These guys have fish coming. These guys won't have fish if they don't mend. Both busy about the business. Hard workers, go-getters. I think a lot of you people are like that. I see this around our church and in our church family. You know, we did not have and still don't have some superstar group of church planters. This didn't become like this because we have all the A players. We just had people willing to wake up early and get after it. That's been fun to watch. I think God gets all the glory that way. It's kind of fun. It's very... uh, almost anticlimactic in a way, though, too, because you think, like, what'd you do? You're like, nothing. No, no, but come on, I know, you're going to be false. What'd you do? Okay, we showed up. Okay, and then what? We moved our feet. We put chairs out. Some guy had a stick, and he measured so the aisles were wide enough to do big altar calls. No, just, he, he just did that. Somebody said, well, let's have some instruments. People just got after it. People woke up in the morning and didn't look and go, hey, Costi, what are we doing? What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? People woke up and said, I've got a lane. I'm going to run. I think there's something to these men that, that Jesus saw as well. They're a get after it kind of group. Oh, God doesn't need perfect people, maybe just more available people. And then third, I want to consider what he's called them to. So how he called them, interesting. Who he picked, (laughs) interesting. But then what he's called them to. Maybe you want to circle the phrase, follow me. It's a command. It's a change in direction. It's a change in purpose. It's also a change in identity. I'm going to make you no longer fishers of fish, but fishers of men. And notice, Jesus would do this to them and through them. There's another little secret for you about how God works. You don't have to do it all. You just need to be faithful and obedient. He said, follow me. There's the command, so respond, and I will make you the fishers of men. I'll do it. I'll make you this way. I'll bear the fruit. 
Echoes of John 15, 5, as I was studying, I was thinking of when Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. You basically, you can do nothing apart from me, he says. So when God calls you, when he commissions you, you just need to step out in obedient faith and say, okay, here I am. I'll do it. I'll run. I know that you and I, the little rationalist inside of us, comes up and goes, but how? But how? He will do it. Choosing unlikely candidates is how God works. Abraham was almost 100, childless, when God made him the father of many nations. You know, Sarai, she laughed. It is laughable sometimes who God might pick or when he might pick them. It's none of our business, it's God's. Moses had a speech problem, and God made him the leader of his people to lead the exodus. You kind of need to be articulate if you're going to lead a million plus people out of Egypt. You can't go in there stuttering, you know, Pharaoh, please l- let my people, people go, you know, I, if you want, I don't know. No, you have to go in knowing. Now, Aaron was his mouthpiece. God gave him a staff. In all of that, Moses, very insecure. How's it? Oh, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe I'm the wrong guy. Yahweh says, nope, you are the exact one I want. Now pick up the staff and go. I think of Gideon. He only had 300 men to fight, tens of thousands and one. David was out in the fields with the sheep when the prophet lined up all the brothers, all of Jesse's boys, to anoint the next king. And none of them were right. You got any more? Well, there's one, but he's kind of out in the field, a little ruddy type. Where is he? He finds him. God says, that's the one. And what does God tell the prophet? Man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. Think of Paul the apostle who was a persecutor of the church, least likely to become the top missionary in the New Testament church, and then ends up writing some 13 of the 27 New Testament letters, 14 if you want to debate that he wrote Hebrews. What's the principle here? God uses who he wants, how he wants, when he wants. They did not have to be superstars. They just needed to be obedient. And when he called all these men, and there were many women as well, we studied the book of Ruth recently, when he chooses to use whom he uses, what does he want? What is he after? Obedience. Just follow. Just submit. Trust. Why? It's a great example of your faith. To say, I believe that even though I can't see it, and even though I don't know how I'm going to do it, you can. God loves to use willing vessels, submissive vessels. Why? Well, because they don't kick as much. They don't push back as much. They're less inclined to to rebel against the simple directives he gives. And what does he do? Then he uses it. None of these men, none of them were Pharisees. None of them were the religious elite. God could work with religious leaders. He could have used Pharisees. There were some, like Nicodemus, who kind of circles back, and Joseph of Arimathea. There's some, but in general, I think most of them were a little too smart Most of them were too high and mighty in their education. Most of them too polished in their rhetoric, too impressed with the sound of their own voice and the knowledge in their own minds that God would say, step, and they would say, well, my opinion is that maybe we would go this way because based on my research, God doesn't care about your research. He's looking for obedience vessels who will follow him faithfully. Maybe you're sitting here today and you think, well, I'm not God's type. I'm not good enough, talented enough. You know, I don't know enough. No problem. You're just his type. He likes them that way. Moldable, shapeable, teachable, humble, and available. He uses people, not who say, you know, I think I can do it. 
or I know I can do it. He uses people who know they can't, and so they depend on him to do it. That's why he commands it. He's not hinting at a change in direction. He's explicitly obvious. Have you ever taken one of those personality tests? I, I admit, I'm, I'm into them as long as they don't get into the weird psychology. I don't put a ton of stock in them, but there's some helpful ones. You've got the six uh, types of ge- working genius, and you've got these other ones. Basically, what they might help you do, I'm not suggesting you would do this and then chalk everyone up. This is actually my warning in this illustration. They help you, though, figure out why people are the way they are. So let's say I have, you know, I take one and my wife takes one. I maybe get a little less bothered by the way she is or vice versa. Because why? Well, I know the way you think. Go, oh, that's why. It actually makes us kind of kinder. Go, wow, you're actually smarter than me in a lot of ways. No wonder you push back. Or somebody else may look at me and say, oh, that's why. He's wired this way. So personality tests can be helpful. They, they make you kind of see how people tick. And so maybe you find out somebody's the banker type and, and you go, oh, that's why. They're not just cheap. They're just really prudent. Maybe somebody's very people-oriented and creative and you would view them as sort of frazzled and, and disorganized and chaotic. But actually, their, their free-spiritedness is the way God has wired them. And, and thank God they're that way because you're not. <laughs> so we need people, people, and creatives. Uh, you do the, the six types of working genius. You find out somebody has high wonder or tenacity. And, and you, you can build good teams that way. It's like a baseball team. We need a right fielder, a pitcher, a first baseman, what have you. So you want people in the right seat on the bus. But here's where I want to encourage you this morning. And I also want you to be very careful. I remember some guy putting on all these personality tests at a church. It's one thing to do it in business or do it when you're team building and go, hey, we're all on the team. We just want to have the right seat on the bus, so let's figure out how we operate so we're all in our happy place. And he started saying, you know, which leaders would have growing churches and which ones wouldn't and which people should this and which that. And he he started chalking everyone up spiritually to what God could do, would do, might do, or even couldn't do because of their little personality test that was based on multiple choice. And at that point, I remember laughing inside and thinking, you're going to use multiple choice and a little test that's supposed to help us just understand how people operate. And you're going to try to predict the success of these men and these women and what God can do. Okay, now you have left the station of reason and biblical logic, and you've gotten on the crazy train, if you ask me. You're out of your mind. None of these guys would have done well in the Myers-Briggs testing room. None of them would have made Patrick Lencioni uh, think that they would be the next great CEO. None of them would have been in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books. Why? Because God loves to show off how he works. And I want to encourage you, if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, yeah, I just don't have what it takes. You're thinking too much about your inadequacies and too little about God's power. He selects, he gifts, he calls, he deploys, and he will bear the fruit through you. And you are actually more likely to be used by God When you have that view, because he gets all the glory. Jesus' radical selection makes a joke of man's approach. God is in the business of using all his people. But these men respond, and that's amazing too, and I want to get to that. So let's look not just at the radical selection, but the radical submission here. Verse 20 and verse 22. That's where we'd be for the the final two points. Verse 20. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. That's verse 20 and verse 22. In both sets of brothers. They're busy. They're doing what they should be doing. Peter and Andrew are in the middle of catching fish. If it were some of us, we, we might say, sounds good. Let me haul this in. Let me gut them. 
clean them, let me get them to market, make a little money, take a shower, clean up, and then we'll meet you over there, Jesus. No, immediately. The other two pair that with their father being there, which Matthew mentions for good reason. In that culture, provision would be a family affair. And certainly with a, a patriarchal culture, the honor of father, they just leave him. Now, there is good evidence that uh, Zebedee was a righteous man. There's great evidence that he was aware of Jesus and of the storyline. And so, maybe uh, it is too far to say that he would be bothered and these guys said, see you later, Dad. We don't care what you think. We're following Jesus. You know, we don't want to make too much of this. Very likely, Zebedee was proud that his sons were following this teacher. Further evidenced by the fact that his wife would, again, want them in the press box with him. How do they respond? Immediately. It's radical submission. He beckons, they fold. They don't ask a question. They just follow. Do you love them that way? Can Jesus disrupt your life in the best way? When the Lord's commands fall upon your heart, when you're reading the Word, when you're sitting under preaching or you're doing a study, and you see that God has said it, does it move you? Can anyone move you like Him? Can anyone alter your life and its course like He can? No one should have that kind of power, but Christ most certainly should. If he opens your eyes to something, can you ever go back? Are you ever going to be the same? I hope you can answer, no, no one moves me like he does. Once I see it, I can never go back. Once he says it, I'm compelled, I'm convicted. Even when I fail, even when I sin, my heart is held captive to the master. I hope you can say those things, but if you can't, then you are not a true disciple in the way that the Bible defines it. Spurgeon said the call was effectual. No nets can entangle those whom Jesus calls to follow him. They come straight away. They come at all cost. They come to quit old haunts. They come to follow their leader without stipulation or reserve. You've burned the ships. You've blown the docks. You love him. He can say anything and move you. He can tell you what to do and you'll do it. He has you like no one else. That's the radical submission that Jesus calls his disciples to. And guess what? It's a stipulation that hasn't changed since the very beginning. Even today, you and I, if we would say we are learners, followers, pupils, we're his students, we're his ambassadors, we're his people, he calls us to a radical submission. I don't know what it will be in your life right now that the Holy Spirit will bring conviction on you regarding, but... Rest assured, you are in the right place and you're doing the right thing no matter what anybody else says around you when you are immediately submissive to the Lord, period. doesn't matter who gaslights you, who tells you you're wrong, who gives you their opinion, who brings the evidence from the other angles. You can know without a shadow of a doubt that you are in God's will. And it's not just a radical selection, not just a radical submission, but this will then lead to, third and finally, a radical sacrifice. Let's read those verses again and reflect on that angle here. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Verse 22, immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. They sacrificed by following him. Their livelihoods were reduced. There's good evidence that they continued to fish here and there. They were able to fish. By the way, where Jesus did ministry wasn't far from the epicenter. So I think sometimes we, we think that uh, Jesus calls them and they go and, and say, you know, okay, and they follow. And then sometime, I don't know, maybe three weeks later, maybe two weeks, maybe a month later, they happen to be walking by the house and their wife is out there like this. And the kids are like, Daddy, where have you been? 
And they go, hey, sorry about that day. You know, Jesus said, come, and I just had to leave. So, yeah, yeah, great to see you guys. We got to go, though. We got some dead people to raise and some demons to cast out. So I'll catch you, catch you on the next round. We'll see you in a bit. And sorry, guys, got to sacrifice for the Lord. No, 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 no. You got to retool your thinking. Jesus does a lot of ministry in Galilee, okay? The Bible does not tell us every single night where they stayed, where they slept, who's home, I mean, Peter's mother-in-law is still given mention. Jesus heals her. They're going into homes. You've got to think of this in a little more of a communal aspect. Their livelihoods weren't completely gone in the sense that they never fished again or they never did anything again. No, but they were greatly reduced. It was a different way of life. It was a different approach to life, a different approach to family priorities. Their loyalties had to shift. Everything was interrupted. And while it's Jesus who emphasized the priority of marriage, of honor, you know, his own mother, he's on the cross, he says, John, behold your mother. He was very aware and very loving towards his family. He was sweet to children. They would come to him, and he would rebuke his disciples for preventing the children to come. Jesus is not a home wrecker in that sense. He's looking for you to just bounce one day, and everyone needs to understand that you love Jesus now. No. He balances the honor for family with the priority of surrendering your life perfectly. And in every instance where he speaks about the priority of serving or loving him, What he does, though, is he puts himself above one's own family, one's own livelihood, and one's own agenda. That's what's happening here. He's saying, now you follow me. You come, you go, you serve, you work, you interact, all of it my way, on my terms. You're mine. I want you to to just... Turn briefly. Let's do this with, a, with kind of quick fingers. Go to Matthew 10. This will all be in sequence. I want to show you how Jesus reorders things in a way that should cause us to reflect on how we're living as disciples. This is all going somewhere. Go to verse 34, Matthew 10. Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay, what does he mean by that? I thought Jesus was always just loving and sweet and cuddly and kind. Okay, he is, but don't miss this. Verse 35, for I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. Okay, so family relationships are going to change. What he's saying is, following me, Obeying me, loving me is going to disrupt things. If you're loyal to me above all else, it doesn't mean families can't enjoy following the Lord together. It doesn't even mean that you, under common grace, can enjoy uh, some fellowship with your family members who aren't believers, that everyone just hates you all the time and you hate them. No, but it is to say that when it comes down to it, what will now determine loyalty for us is Christ above all. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake will find it. His whole point is, if your mom can call you and derail your obedience to Christ, you love her more. You're a disciple of mom, not of Christ. If your boss can call you and say, you will do this and you'll keep your Christianity out of here. I'm not tolerating that. You'll say this and you do it because you're a slave to the paycheck and you don't trust the Lord. What will happen if I obey you? This will happen and then this will happen and then I'll, I won't be capitalizing on, on my retirement contributions and I won't have money and I won't this and then little you know, Bobby can't play on the travel team. and little. You've, you're thinking about all the wrong things, friend. And by the way, you have a small view of God who controls everything. Go to chapter 12. Just look at verses 46 to 50. 
It's about changed relationships because of love and loyalty for Christ, for him, the Father. While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and his brothers were standing outside seeking to speak with him. I think this is one of the most relatable moments for us with the life of Christ. (laughs) They sent a text. We're outside. We need to talk. Someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers, they're standing outside seeking to speak with you. But Jesus answered, the one who was telling him, and he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, don't miss that, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. What's he saying? You do the will of God, we're family. You'll be closer sometimes to people in this room than you are to your own blood family and blood relatives. Why? Simply because of loyalty and allegiance to Christ. That's what discipleship is. Now, by the grace of God, I hope this for my family, for yours, for all of us together, that generation after generation after generation is strong and running together. And that decision never really has to be made. I pray for that all the time for my own children. But if it comes down to it, who are my Mother, my brother, and my sisters, those who do the will of God. One more, and then this tour is done. Luke 14. The crowds are following. Demons have been casted out. Free food has been given. Just think of Jesus as kind of a one-man vending machine of sorts in a in the minds of a lot of people. It's like free food trucks and miracles would be the name of of kind of his tour in their mind. But that's not how he sees it. Look at verse 25. This is the test of true discipleship. Now large crowds were going along with him and he turned to them and said, this is like bad church growth strategy. If anyone comes to me and does not hate The word just translates a lesser love. That's all it means. His own father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. He can't be my disciple. What's he saying? You gotta love me most. To follow me is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of everything that you say you're about and you wanna do and you've got going. And it's to say, Jesus, maybe you will bless some of those things, but if you didn't, I'm following you. Maybe It'll be, I get those good things and the greater thing. Maybe there'll be some wonderful things in my life, but ultimately, whatever you call me to, I'll follow you. Has it been a sacrifice for you to follow Jesus? What have you given up? I'm not saying this by way of legalism or some asceticism, like you got to now suffer. No, you don't try to. Trials find you anyway. Suffering comes to you. But just by way of obeying the Lord, Are some relationships strained in your life because you have been faithful to Christ? Has your loyalty gotten you in trouble in some way? Just your loyalty to obey God. Just by saying, hey, the Bible says this, here's what I'm going to do. Or or, this is very, very simple. People try to complicate it. You keep going back to it. Yeah, but it's simple for me. I love you, but here is what I'm going to do. If you're not seeing just even pockets of trouble in your life and conflict, from obeying the Lord, friend, you're not living as a disciple. Because where he goes, let me just kind of ruin your day maybe for some of you, where he goes leads to a little bit of trouble, okay? And if you get yourself behind him and you're following, albeit stumbling along, you're going to end up in a little bit of trouble. If your life is a smooth sailing American dream, I would just encourage you today to go home to pray or come talk to one of us after, whatever you need to do, and you just think, Lord, where am I cruising down easy street? Where am I shirking responsibility? Where am I chickening out? I'm not saying you need to go burn down the office tomorrow with a crusade. What I'm saying is, every day living as a disciple with a pursuit of obedience is going to cost you in some way eventually. 
And if it's not at all, I love you and I want you to ask big questions. Let me give you three truths to put into action today and then we'll pray. Number one, exalt Christ with a thankful heart. If you're a disciple today, listen, you think about Jesus selecting these men, you think about the way he has selected you, what can you do but praise him and be thankful? You didn't muster up enough good works, good intentions, you didn't wake up to change your own life one day. No, no, no. He did it and that's why he gets our worship. And so exalt him, praise him all the more. Think about him all week long and his goodness and his grace with a thankful heart. Number two, embrace obedience with a joyful heart. No more for some of you. Kind of loathing the word obey and, and, and looking to make excuses like, oh, here's the legalism again. No, 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 no. You got a problem, okay? And I'm sorry if someone hurt you and I'm sorry if somebody was legalistic and misrepresented the commands of Christ. But look, when you love him and you're all about him and he's taken over, his commands aren't burdensome, amen? I want to follow him. When I fail, I want to confess. When I sin, I want to repent. I'm not going to be perfect. That's not what obedience is. It's the pursuit of following him and doing what he's commanded. And on this side of glory, you're not going to nail that. But you got to embrace it with a joyful heart. Why? Because obedience leads to joy. Not pride, not look at me, but look at you, Lord. I'm so thankful. Oftentimes, the, the people who get frustrated over the idea of obedience, or they, you know, what about, and what about, and what about, typically, two things. Number one, it's an overreaction to legalism, and yeah, there's some who make, uh, you know, good behavior, everything, and Christ becomes nothing. That's bad. We're not into that. But two, people who get frustrated over the word obey or the concept of obedience often can have a guilty conscience because uh, they've been getting drunk on the weekends, or they've been looking at pornography, or they've been talking to people in a way that's not godly. They've been using language they would never use. And they're not confessing it to the Lord. Maybe they're cheating their finances. They're stealing in some way. Maybe they're ignoring a host of other sins. And then they hear a sermon or they hear the word obey and they feel really guilty. They go, well, I just don't feel like that's the grace of God. No, it's time for you, brother or sister, to get really honest and experience the grace of God. Number three, expect challenges with a hopeful heart. Expect challenges with a hopeful heart. The disciples will eventually come to experience great challenges, far more difficult than sacrificing a job or upsetting some family members at, at Christmas or Thanksgiving. And they would eventually write letters loaded with encouragement. One particular letter, 1 Peter, he says, set your hope fully on the grace of God. Why? Peter knew that despite the trials of this earth and the challenges that you'd face, that the triumph of heaven was coming and a greater hope was to come. I want to encourage you, you, you may never lose a job for following Jesus. Maybe you will. You may never experience a, a divorce or a, a big break in your family for following Jesus. Maybe you will. But no matter what you face when you're following him, what he's not promised is an easy path, but he has promised that his path is the one that leads to victory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, help us to love you and love your son all the more. Help us to embrace obedience with a joyful, eternal perspective. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness in all things in the midst of our unfaithfulness and, and faithlessness. We need you, and we declare that even to obey you, we need you, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to do a mighty work within us for your glory. Work in the hearts of your people, mine included, today and this week, so that we might follow you more closely, more faithfully, even in the midst of our stumblings. As you carry us along, we want to follow you, Lord Jesus. We pray this and ask it all in your name. Amen. I love you, church. Prayer team is here. We'll see you this Friday for our Good Friday service. Love you.